Hey, hey, happy Monday to everybody. I'm Katie Kimball from KitchenStewardship.com, and this is the 10th edition of the KS Connect Plus. This is a special summer edition. We're, uh, we're taking most of the summer off, but I could not pass up the chance to hang out with Lindsay Ostrom of PinchofYum.com and Suzanne Perazzini from StrandsOfMyLife.com, coming all the way from New Zealand where it's tomorrow, which cracks me up. I hope that's okay. The time zone is going to still crack me up. <laughs> we are talking today about food photography for bloggers, and I cannot wait to just pull a ton of information out of these ladies' brains and learn a lot, and I'll let you all listen in too. So with that being done, I would love Lindsay and Suzanne to introduce themselves. Tell us, ladies, a little bit about um, your blog, how you got started, you know, why you are an expert or semi-expert in food photography, and if you have any, any other hats you wear, because we all know that bloggers rarely do just one thing. Suzanne, tell us a little about yourself. All right, I'm Suzanne Pierazzini from strandsofmylife.com. I've been blogging for about eight years altogether, but I've only had Strands of My Life about two and a half years. And this blog that I have now is all about the low FODMAP diet, which has been proven to eliminate the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, which is my thing at the moment. I now have also have an exciting coaching program for those on the diet, and it's been such a, a thrill to turn people's lives around from sort of miserable and painful to um, symptom-free. It's, it's just been incredible. So that's my main focus at the moment. But I do have a second income stream from taking food photographs for other bloggers who don't seem to have the time or maybe even the skill to take them themselves. So I do that as well and I love doing that. Great. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Uh, Lindsay, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are online. Yeah, um, well, I have a blog called Pinch of Yum, and um, I started the blog about five years ago, well, four, four or five years ago, um, and I just started it as a hobby, and um, my husband uh, came on with me um, a couple, like a couple years after starting it to kind of help um, develop the income side of it, so I was a teacher at the time, an elementary school teacher, and then um, just this year in June, I finished out my last year of teaching. Um, and I'm going to do the blog full time now. So I'm super excited about that. And food photography has a big um, role, has had a big role in why I've been able to like leave my job and um, pursue my blog now full time. So, um, and then also on my blog, um, we, well, um, like last year, I wrote a food photography ebook um, called Tasty Food Photography. And um, yeah, and so that's a part of um, what we do on the blog as well as teach about um, food photography and, and mostly teach like beginning skills to new bloggers because I'm completely self-taught um, and you know I've taken a few classes and read a few books but I don't have any kind of a background in photography and so um, I think if I can learn it then other people can too and so I really get a lot of joy out of you know teaching people um, the things that have been helpful to me. Thank you, Lindsay. I just I love the self-starting story and congratulations on going full-time pro blogger. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and then so you have Pinch of Yum is your beautiful food site, and you talk a little bit about food photography there. But correct me if I'm wrong. You have a membership site as well for bloggers. Yeah, we do. Um, so that website is called Food Blogger Pro, and we started that. I think it's been like a year and a half now that it's been up and running. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like a training site where um, mostly Bjork does most of it, but I I've done a few of the um, like the videos on the site. It's all a training website, so there's a whole bunch of videos training bloggers on anything that. Um, you know that they might not know how to do on their own so things like um, using WordPress or n learning about SEO and monetization and then obviously food photography um, is another piece of that so excellent I knew it you guys have lots of hats you wear alright so now <laughs> we're gonna jump into the food photography and I'm personally very excited about this because I've gone from five years ago literally I have pictures of like a casserole in the oven or just like a plate at 7 p.m. in Michigan on my table in the winter. They're, I mean, they're just like make me puke pictures. They're so bad when I look at my old posts. Like, oh, gosh. And then I thought I was getting a ton better, <laughs> and they still really stunk. So now I'm actually getting a little bit better, but I still have a lot to learn. So I'm excited about tonight, and I know with especially with Pinterest, food photography is so important for people. Um, but what, what do you guys think? What's your philosophy on and why bother 
with food photography and, and what's the real goal in, uh, in taking beautiful food pictures, Suzanne? I'm, well, I'm personally, I'm a very visual person and I sort of love things to be beautiful. Uh, when I started taking photos for my blog, I was not happy with them just like you at all with how they looked and so I, I hated actually having them on my blog and so I started to explore photography online and also at that time my son, he would just finished a degree in architecture and had started a two-year diploma in photography. So he was heaps of help on the technical side and he thought I was a complete twerk with everything I did because <laughs> he knew so much. But anyway, he was very, very useful. And I mean, I really believe the majority of people prefer a well-taken photograph of pretty food over one snapped in bad light with the food just sort of thrown on the plate. And I hate to look back at my old photos as well, Katie. <laughs> Oh, I bet they're not as bad as mine. We can have a toilet uh, bowl competition sometime. <laughs> we can. <laughs> Lindsay, I think you've had some awesome success with particularly your photography building your blog. So why has it been important for Pinch of Yum to have beautiful food photos? Well, I think that, you know, with so many food blogs out there and so much content out there in general, like so many recipes online, it's hard to... Um, I think it's hard sometimes for people to um, know, sort through what are the good recipes, what are the bad recipes, like where is the quality content. And um, having good food photos along with your awesome, already awesome recipes, I think it gives you some authority and, and also clearly communicates what your food is to your readers. So, you know, I would, there would be times I would make things that would be so, so good and I would know that if anybody tried it, you know, they would love this recipe, but then I would take a picture that really didn't reflect that and it's just really hard um, when what you're trying to do is really clearly communicate your food to people. Um, I mean, just a, a good, clear, nice to look at photo uh, makes all the difference. And then also, just with the rise of social media and how people are consuming um, you know like their content or or what's in front of them on a regular basis and it's social sites and social sites you know I heard it said the other day in like a it's like an online article um, talking about images being the like the currency of the social media world or like the language of the social media world <laughs> where um, that's what that's what's gonna catch people you know text isn't gonna do it anymore um, and I don't know if it ever really did it um, in the same way that images can but images are just everywhere and there are so many places that you can put them so you know the opportunities are just everywhere um, and with a good image you can really I feel like it really just opens the door to let people in um, to your content yeah very well said do you think that over the past like three to five years has the standard changed as the bar been raised yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, uh, just with more and more people starting blogs, you know, mm -hmm. and more food photography out there. Um, yeah, I think the standards have changed, but I also think that, um, you know, it's not like it's not achievable. I think more people are, like, able now to get their photography, or maybe more people are just paying attention to it. Um, but I feel like it's all the more encouraging, like, if everybody, you know, if all these people can get their photos to a certain level, um, then you, with a great recipe, you know, you can also get your photo to that level and maybe even a little bit um, more, a, a better photo that's more engaging um, to your audience. Awesome. Suzanne, what do you think? Has the standard changed over the last few years of food blogging? Oh, I would say absolutely, Im immensely. In the beginning, the food blogs were mainly about the recipes and the photographs were pretty horrendous, almost <laughs> an afterthought. <laughs> but, I mean, now, the, the layman, like I was back then, and like you were, Lindsay, we, we mm -hmm. just had so much, so many resources online, to um, so many opportunities to improve our skills without actually having to pay for a course or anything. We could just learn online and so other people have been doing that and um, and there's wonderful examples out there to follow. I used in the very beginning I'd print out a photograph of some food I loved and then I'd try to imitate it. I wouldn't put that on my blog because it looked too much, actually it never looked quite like it, believe me, but um, but I practiced that way, just seeing how they placed their composition, uh, the angle of the camera, those different things, I tried to imitate it. But I mean, today the food bloggers are now producing just 
the beautiful and, and they're a pleasure to look at. The ones who aren't have probably fallen more by the wayside unless they got a really strong following in those early days and then those people keep going there even though some of those mm -hmm. photos need help. And that's what I'm helping with as well. No, Katie, surely yeah. not. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at anything on my blog for like this February. It's really uh, pretty low. But <laughs> no, that was, that was a great, great tip, Suzanne, just on emulating what you see that you like. And I agree that, that food photography, the bar is so, so, so high. Um, so, y'all, we need this. We need this hangout on air. Let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's start with equipment. Beyond an iPhone, which I'm assuming is a little bit too low for the bar that has been raised, what basic supplies would you recommend for someone? Again, can you take great pictures with an inexpensive camera? Um, and Suzanne will let you start off with this one. Uh, well, I started off with a, a point and shoot but I quickly became really frustrated with its limitations. I mean, I think some people do some pretty good things with them, but, and also, of course, I had my son in my ear ask me what I thought I was doing with a point and shoot. So, I mean, I could see there were really great photos, like I said, and I wanted to imitate what they could create, and I really wasn't managing it. So I just went online to Trade Me, which is like your eBay over there in the US. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and just bought a, a cheap, camera, it was a, a Nikon 300D, and I mean, I think they're now up to like 700 or something like that, so I'm way behind, but it's the same camera I've got today, and it, it certainly does the, the job, so I'd recommend getting at least something like that. Now, I've got several lenses, but I use the same lens all the time for food photography, a 15 millimeter one, um, that can take me down to 1.8 f-stop, and I just use my other lenses when I'm traveling or, or whatever. And apart from that, I have a reflector, uh, which gets used for every shot, a couple of big photographic la lamps for night shots, and that I can put up on either side of the food, and they create like a little light box effect. I also have a tripod, which I personally use always, always use a tripod. I know some people probably got steadier hands than me and, and maybe in good light you can get away with that with the shutter speed as fast but if your light's not perfect you might have a slower shutter speed so you're going to need your tripod to keep that camera steady. So that's that's my equipment. Okay, great. Lindsay, what, uh, what did you start out with and what are you working with now? Um, well, I started, I've used both Canon and Nikon um, cameras, but I've always used the same lens, which is a 50 millimeter um, 1.4 lens, and I really love that. It's a prime lens, so there's no zoom in, zoom out. Um, mm -hmm. It's always that fixed focal length, um, which I really, it works well for food. Um, and I've really enjoyed that lens really recently. Well, actually right now I'm using a, a Canon 6D is my camera body. And then um, the, the lens that I am using most frequently right now is one that Bjork just got me. Um, actually, I think it was like for my birthday, he got it for me this year, so a couple months ago. It's a, um, like a macro lens, so it's 100 millimeters. Um, so basically it just means like I could stand farther back but still get a really nice up close angle on the food without having to go, you know, lean way in with my camera. Um, it's really nice. I really like it for for at least the style that um, you know that I'm doing on my blog for food photography. Um, and that's a it's a 100 millimeter, and I think it's a 2.8 um, like f-stop aperture setting. So um, so yeah, I really like that one. And then I have a lamp. I have one lamp that I use from time to time. I have a little cardboard reflector. Um, and then also we have like one big round reflector, but honestly I don't use those that often. And Suzanne, I think it's so interesting that you said that you always use a tripod because one of the things that I feel like, I don't know, it's just funny about, about how everybody does it differently, but I almost never use a tripod. And, and part of that's like, you know, I you get used to a certain way of doing something and so for me I'm used to moving around, I'm used to holding it and then moving this way and moving this way so whenever I have to get the tripod I just get really frustrated like I feel so <laughs> like I'm locked into one yeah. spot you know but but really I was just I just used it the other day for something and it's so it's also such a valuable tool you know 
Um, so there's kind of the trade-off, obviously, with the equipment of what fits yeah. your style and, and what you feel like most comfortable using. So anyways, we have a tripod, but I just I don't use it that often. Yeah, you, you should see the things that I do with my tripod, Lindsay. I hold it this way and that way and my oh, leg down my. here and the leg down there and it gets very, very frustrating. I, I do agree. I just, for the light that I often have in the evening when I'm photographing, it's just not good enough. You get yep. that slower shutter speed. But, um, uh, oh look, if I could take it off that tripod, I'd feel as free as a bird. <laughs> <laughs> that is fun to hear about the different um, different styles. Methods. Yeah, different styles. Um, my my computer is upset with me. It's uh it's threatening to lock up. So if I disappear, we'll uh we'll figure it out. But so I apologize that sometimes it's not. I don't think we're always looking at the person who's talking because my computer's real slow right now. Um, oops. <laughs> anyway, so you threw out some terms like millimeter length on lens and f stop, and I basically know what f stop is from 15 years ago in high school. But I don't know if everyone necessarily does, and that's kind of a related question. Do you have to know a lot of manual commands? Do you have to shoot in RAW, which I have no idea what that is, but I've read it before? <laughs> or can you get pretty decent or verging on incredible results with automatic set? Like, where, where is the learning curve going on there? Lindsay, what do you think about that? Um, I, well, I, okay. I just taught a photography class and um, like a couple a couple weeks ago, and they said, you know, don't don't talk too much about the manual settings because I think most people are gonna want to use the automatic. So just kind of talk about the composition and stuff. That's what they told me before I went um, to the class. But I just I couldn't not talk about the manual settings because I really feel like it's cheating people of you know what their camera can really do and just what food photography is in general to not teach people just the, the only what they need to know you know the very most basic things that are going to allow them um, to manipulate the light and manipulate the the way that things look in the photograph to get it how they want it to look so all that to say I think it's really important and actually I ended up covering just a few things and that's what most people in the class you know really wanted to learn was like I have this nice camera a lot of them were bloggers and they say like you know I got this camera because of my blog but I just have never taken the you know taken the initiative to learn how to get off of the automatic so I, I don't use automatic so I don't and I, I never have actually so mm -hmm. I would say I don't know you know um, as far as taking an awesome picture, I'm sure it's possible if you have all the right things in place. You know, if everything looks great and the light's perfect for what you have. And but I really, really, really would encourage you know anybody who's learning food photography. I would really encourage you to learn your manu manual settings. And I think the most important one. This is just me personally. I think the most important one is aperture because you can start with your if you have a DSLR, you can start with your camera on the aperture priority setting, and that allows you to just it's kind of like the baby step to using your manual settings where all you control is the aperture and that's that like the f-stop um, thing that we were talking about and it just basically means how much background blur that you get um, in the photograph so um, you know a lower number is going or like a, a 1.4 is going to be really wide open it's going to let in a lot of light and it's also going to make it really blurry in the background and that's you know it's an important thing to be able to control and that that um, aperture priority setting on the camera will compensate for any of the light and it just allows you to basically control the blur and I feel like even just start with that you know try try one manual control um, and then the other two that I use are shutter speed and ISO. Obviously, just those are like the three, the trifecta of the um, you know manual controls that I end up manipulating for all my shots. So, anyways, that was a long answer, but my my like encouragement is learn it. It takes time. It's a little tricky at first, but it's totally worth it. Totally worth learning. Good to hear going on my list for this week. Yeah, that. Because I have tasty food photography, and mm -hmm. I've skimmed the whole thing and spent a little more time with, with like you said, the, the um, composure and arrangement of mm -hmm. photos. Is the f-stop and all that stuff in there for me and others? Yes. Yep, it's right at the beginning. I, I have like three <laughs> pages. Um, one page is, uh, I mean, it's easy to just like breeze by, but like it's just like boom, 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 all in a row. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and those are all kind of like the 
the three bulky, you know, pages on it. But really, a lot of what it takes to learn it is just practice and using mm -hmm. them and, um, you know, learning what they do and how to use them. So. Cool. Great tips. What about you, Suzanne? Have you ever done, well, you did start with automatic. What do you think? Can people skip learning that? Or are you on, on Lindsay's side of the line here that you, you really should learn your manual settings? I'm definitely on Lindsay's side of the line. Um, no I never, never. No, no <laughs> cheating. Sorry, sorry. You wanted me to say yes. You can shoot an automatic, but no, <laughs> a little. <laughs> I um, never, never shoot an automatic. It maybe again, it's that control thing I need. But I'm with Len, Lindsay all the way along the line. That as long I actually keep my ISO on a hundred. I don't play mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. So I am playing just with the f-stop and yeah. the shutter speed and those two you can just throw away your camera manual you don't need it because those two will take you really great photos so we're not quite automatic but we're bringing it right down to an essence of, of what is absolutely necessary. You might need more than that for other types of photography I don't know but certainly for food photography that's, that's plenty. And you were also asking about raw shooting in yeah. Raw. Now I always shoot in raw, but you have to have Lightroom for that, of course, for your editing, okay. and it makes an enormous difference. I mean, it's not necessary, no, but it means that you can control every little detail of your photo in Lightroom using raw. So it's just a far superior to trying to edit a JPEG, which doesn't have a lot of information in it. The raw image has a lot of information that you can play with. So in Lightroom you can actually transform an average photo into a great photo and you can sometimes even take a tragic photo technically, not <laughs> with the composition, you can't change that, but technically, and you can improve it. Uh, you mightn't be able to completely transform it, but you can improve it. So, And you, you can, can't really do that with Photoshop. You can play around a bit and make it look a bit brighter and a bit sharper and what next, but you can't play with the details of the image. Good to so know. So raw all the way. Good to know. Okay, so see now I understand a little bit more about raw. So are you saying that um, Photoshop editing can't work with raw? Did I hear that right? Like if you're just working in Photoshop to edit your pictures, don't bother with raw? No, if you've only got Photoshop, the raw won't work there. Okay. You have Good to, to have Lightroom. Unless somebody's telling me I'm not telling the truth here, but I, I think that's true. <laughs> No, you can use a raw file in Photoshop. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, because that's what I mean. I use Lightroom for organizing, but I use Photoshop for all my editing, and I open raw files in Photoshop all the time. So, okay. yep. Ah, I must it. try it. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's my son making me use Lightroom. <laughs> Good to know. Now, see, Lightroom and Photoshop are two programs that I've been like, I don't have time to learn these things. I've heard about Photoshop that there's there's just so many intricacies and you can take a whole course just to figure out the basics. So my little tip for food bloggers, if yeah, you don't have a lot of time, is to pay someone else to do your work for you. <laughs> so I do, I do have someone on staff who just makes my pictures beautiful and she does take some that are rather tragic. <laughs> pull them out of the depths that they're not wonderful by any means, but they're better. Um, yeah. So that's been, I mean, that's been a boost to my own food photography without me having to do you know, learn anything new or do a learning curve. Um, and just a little plug for that, for Suzanne, she'll actually take the photos for you. <laughs> right, Suzanne? You do some food <laughs> photography for other people. Yeah, it's it's a part of my business. It just kind of evolved uh -huh. naturally that people liked my photography and asked if I would do it. So they send me recipes and I make the recipe. My family eats it for dinner and I yeah. photograph it and they pay for it. And yeah, I do quite a lot of that now. But it was nothing I sort of went after, it just happened and then they told each other about it, other bloggers and now we have all sorts of dinners. <laughs> <laughs> There's your meal planning. Yeah, I have this huge list of old posts that need help and I've been ticking through them and at the bottom it says which ones am I going to ask Suzanne to do that I don't want to do. With. <laughs> so definitely there. Yeah, um, yeah we, get, we get a big variety of food for our meals and the family sometimes turn their nose up but most of the time it's okay. And also you can fudge it. If the recipe that arrives isn't quite how you'd like it, you can still make it taste better because it's uh -huh. going to look the same in the photograph. 
<laughs> That's funny. That's a good uh, feedback. Maybe we didn't like this one. Um, <laughs> I, I never say that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, then I won't. Ask. What are um, what would you say like for people just starting out who are looking at quite a long chess checklist of new skills that they need to learn from composing the photo to lighting to f-stops and RAW and Photoshop and Lightroom and all these things like where would you start the two to three kind of skills or techniques that that one needs to start with in order to take a halfway decent slash decent <laughs> food photo what are the what are the basic basics that we cannot skip Lindsay um, I would say for, first and foremost, you know, lighting. I think it's really, uh, it's like kind of at the core of it, of just photography in general, but specifically food photography, lighting is super important. Um, and it just has a huge effect on the way that your photos look. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, like practicing shooting next to a window instead of under your kitchen lights, that would be step one, you know, go next to a window. Mm -hmm. And putting, arranging the light in different places to see what you like best, you know, do you like it on the side, do you like it at the back. Um, I think a lot of times when you're, at least I know this was true for me when I was just starting out, I am I really thought like you need to have the light on above or like in front of the food but really you really it's kind of counterintuitive but you really don't want the light to be right in front of your food because it's just going to wash it flat and you're not going to be able to see the depth of the you know kind of like the texture on the food and it just kind of washes it all out so putting a light positioning a light whether it's a window or a lamp to the side um, you know, that's going to illuminate the textures and show you some shadows and make it look a little bit more um, appealing, I guess. So lighting is a huge one. And then obviously I said this before, but just um, uh, manual settings, I think, I, I don't know, in my opinion, it, there's you're really limiting yourself by not, um, by not, you know, trying to learn some of the manual settings and just even taking aperture as the first one and working in aperture priority mode. You don't have to go into full manual. You could just use aperture priority mode to start and um, learn how that works. And I, it's kind of addicting. Like once you start using it and you realize like, whoa, I have all this control and, and I can think, what do I want the photo to do? And then I turn this wheel and then I get what I want out of the camera. And you see how much of a difference it makes. It, you, you just, it's really hard to think about ever going back. So those would be my kind of my two things, I guess. Okay, so even more important than composition of the photo? Yeah, yep, I would say. Ooh, that's a big surprise. Now, I love that you talked about lighting and you didn't talk about what fancy equipment you need to order. So let's talk a little bit about that window thing and time of day. And, you know, I know I live in Michigan, you live in Minnesota, Lindsay, so we got about three months of the year where we have decent natural light after, you know, work hours or whatever. What are, yeah. what are some basic ground rules that you would, or maybe recommendations that you would give to people for how to capture the best light, whether it be natural or, and you mentioned a lamp, which was a yep. little surprise to me. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I rarely use the lamp um, that I have. And when I was, I mean, I'm not, now I don't have a normal day job, so I can, you know, even in the winter I'll be able to shoot during the day. But, but for the last four years of my blog, I've always you know, been working in the winter, so I do come home and it's 4 p.m. and it's dark out already. Yeah. And so um, my advice for that would be, I guess, twofold. The first thing would be um, to decide how important it is to you to have natural light, and if it is important, just do your photos on the weekend. And it's hard to, it's like hard pill to swallow, and it's kind of like, oh man, it's annoying. But really, that's that's how I did it. That's how I did. It for the all last four years, I would do all my photography on the weekend because Saturday and Sunday, I know I, I knew I would have at least you know two hours of time where I'd be at home. I could quick scoop my table up next to the window and do the photos that I needed. Um, and I mean, it's just really hard to replicate that, in my opinion. But that being said, you can get some really good, um, you know, lighting with like the lamps that that are made now, and they're specifically made to emulate natural light. So mm -hmm. I use uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it's I think it's pronounced Lowell, and then it's like E G O capital E G O. Um, um, now I'm not blanking on the rest of the name, but it's. Um, <laughs> A digital imaging lamp, that's what it is. A digital imaging lamp is what it's called. And it's like maybe $100. Um, 
And I use, like, I'll use that. Here's an example of when I use that was when I did my most recent e-cookbook. It was all through the winter that I was working on it. And I would have made it home, you know, in time to just barely catch some light. But um, I wanted the light to be consistent. And you know how it can change from day to day. Sometimes it, the colors and the, the strength of the light can change. So mm -hmm. I just did all of them in my dark basement with this one light on and, like, a little cardboard reflector on the other side so that they would all look the same because, you know, when you're doing them in a series like that. So, um, yeah, so that those are, like, the two um, things I would say would be either adjust your schedule so that you could be in natural light or um, invest in a, in a lamp. And you can really, I mean, you can really get some good effects. Actually, can I, I, I pulled some pictures. I'm going to try to, um, like, <laughs> switch my screen here. Okay, like, oh, can you see my light room now? Yes. Okay, cool. This, um... Like, this photo was taken with my lamp. So, um, like, my lamp is back here. And then I have a little cardboard reflector up on this side, like, right there. And then I'm taking it from straight on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is another one that was taken with my lamp. And this one has the lamp all the way at the back. And then I probably put a reflector up front here somewhere. Um, but, I don't know, to me, in my opinion, those photos, um, you know, would be comparable to the ones that I would take in natural light. So, okay. I don't know, just thought that was maybe a good thing to show. Yeah, for sure. It's really good to know. And it's good to hear that you can make a small investment in real equipment as opposed to a massive investment <laughs> in real equipment. Um, and then if, if you ladies would mind either during or after the show, if you just put in the... Um, Put on the event page things like your favorite camera and lens and that lamp you just mentioned. I think that would be awesome for people to see those and feel free to use affiliate links if you've got them, whatever, you know. Um, Sounds good. That would be, that'd be really great for people to follow, and I can put them in the show notes too. Um, Susie Ann, what are your two or three foundational can't possibly skip it techniques that people need to learn right off the bat? Uh, exactly what Lindsay said. <laughs> and um, I'm going to add in since she got the other two. <laughs> the, the, the styling that you mentioned, Katie, the, the okay. composition, the, the styling. I mean, really, a stew can either look a brown, inedible blob, or it can have some, be something that can encourage you to make the dish and so you want to eat it. Right. So you do need to take a little bit of time just trying to stop it from looking like a blob and making sure that you can see the individual foods in it. And, um, and you know, there's various different tricks for that. For example, if you've got a plate of soup and it just looks like blah, put a little bit of sour cream in the middle, sprinkle some herbs or paprika on top, and suddenly you've got something different. And then you, you play with the light and you make it into something a little bit special. I saw one of Lindsay's photos there where she had the light from the back. Now that's a, a technique I, I love, especially with um, sunlight. I shoot straight into the light and it blows out the back of the photo, but you get a lot of detail in the food. I think that's a really neat effect, although those photos would never get accepted by food gawk or, or taste spotting. They, they say that that has lighting issues. <laughs> mm. But I don't think so. I think they're fantastic photos. I love them like that. So yes, I think the styling is really important. You can't just throw food on a plate and expect it to look good. Your technique can be perfect, your light can be perfect, and the food's still going to look like a blob of brown mess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't let your photos look like a blob. That's the tip for the ages there. That's good. <laughs> So just to, just to recap, it sounds like there's not a whole lot you can skip. You need to have good lighting. You really should learn manual settings in your photo or your camera, starting with aperture, and you've got to style your food. So we've gotten some really good lighting tips, got some pretty good uh, a manual tips actually, and talked about raw already. So let's talk about food styling. Um, what strategies do you use when you look at you, know, you think about a recipe and think about how do I want to shoot this? Do do you have to have a ton of Props, you know, do food bloggers need to be running around and, and collecting really interesting backgrounds or or what? What are kind of the basics, maybe mid-level photographs and then like some really high level, like if you want to be super fantastic, awesome, what kind of props and styling would you have on hand? Suzanne? Um, I, I think it depends on individual style very much. When I first 
started, I mean, I've got a cupboard full of props. You just kind of accumulate them. You get a bit sure. obsessed about it. But when I first started, I used a lot of props. I'd make more of a complete picture with other foods and plates and dishes and napkins and flowers and all of that. Yeah. And and I still think those sorts of photos are, are lovely. But now I tend to focus more on the food. I get a little bit closer. Not too close. I don't like super close. I feel like I've got to step away from it. But a bit closer and just a little bit of some props in the background, some napkins. I mean, I think you can take pretty good photos just with some obviously some nice dishes that contain your food. Mm -hmm. uh, white's always appropriate unless your food is white, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, some coloured napkins, nice cutlery, some coloured sheets of matte paper, good kitchen bench or a table as your base. Uh, I mean, you can certainly go as far as you like with all that and have all sorts of different bases, which, by the way, I do have. But you can keep it really simple as long as you're taking those good photos. I don't think you have to get carried away with those massively intricate photos. Uh, they're, they're beautiful, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I think those were great tips on, on little things to have on hand and just thinking about, you know, how close you want to be and stuff. Excellent. I know I I'm, I just have a few napkins and placemats. You go to garage sales and grab some yeah. interesting bowls for 25 cents or whatever. Um, Lindsay, what are, your, what are your prop and styling recommendations? Um, I would say the most important thing um, just from, you know, based on what I use all the time and what I feel like is a non-negotiable is some kind of a shooting surface, like a background, um, kind of like Suzanne was saying, like your table or your base or whatever, um, but basically like some kind of like go-to for your setup. Um, it's What's really, go my go-to is, uh, well right now I have, I have a few kind of developing the go-to, but for a long time it's been um, these boards that came from a table that we bought in the market at the Philippines. It's like this old um, scratched up, scuffed up table. So, you know, it has really like a rustic kind of look to it, a worn look to it. And then um, we actually, I was so worried because I thought, we're not going to be able to take this table home from the Philippines. We were, we were living there for a year and I thought, oh no, the table. But Bjork, um, my husband, took the boards off the top of the table and we just packed <laughs> them in the suitcase and brought these boards home because I love them so much. And it really makes a difference. If I were to shoot on like the table I'm sitting at right now which is I don't even know what the material is it's just like shiny wood and it's not very it's kind of ugly and really orange looking um, it, it wouldn't have you know half of the same effect and I feel like a good base or a good background you could put you don't even need a plate like you could put a pile of spinach on it and mm -hmm. turn it so you've got good lighting and you could, it could be beautiful so um, getting a good base or like a good background board um, I think would be important and then I feel like you know I don't know I just don't think you need that much I think you need a couple good white essentials like white plates white bowls that are not huge like smaller to me usually um, works better like a little bit smaller so the foods a little closer together um, and some silverware maybe that's kind of antiqued or or um, has kind of like a unique look to it. A lot of times I get stuff at um, thrift stores or on um, you know garage sales like you said. Doesn't have to be. It always like I always feel sad when when new food photographers and bloggers are like, oh, I went out and I bought all these anthropology dishes for my you know um, for my food photos and they're like super expensive and you just don't need it you know you really don't need it to take a good photo it's fun to have them but you I, I really don't think you need much beyond um, kind of those essentials yeah I just got um, for not very much at all some they're actually photography mats like the kind mm -hmm. that you'd have in large like five by five to put behind you know professional photographs of little children or whatever but they also sell them in like two by two and two by three for food photography. And so they roll up, there's, I got four of them in like white and brown, they look like wood and they just roll up into a tube. So the storage is minimal, which is important for me. So and are they, just, are they vinyl? Is it, are they those vinyl yeah. ones? Yeah. yeah. But they look pretty good. Of, I've heard a lot of people and like I, once I knew that, you know, somebody on food blogger pro said that she had been using those and I went and looked at her photos and I was like, oh wow, that looks really good. You know, I wouldn't have known. And then once you know, then you look at it and you're like, yeah. okay, yeah, I can see that. But <laughs> really, at first glance, yeah. you really, it's a great alternative, I think, for a lot of people who, especially it's hard to know where to find that stuff sometimes. 
Um, and I don't know where you got yours, but I've found, I've heard from a lot of people that, that ordering them on Etsy, they can find them on Etsy, and that's actually where I just got a whole bunch of new, like, wood, actual wood boards, and I actually ordered them also on Etsy. So I think stuff like that is a good um, in-between if you don't want to make your own and you don't know where to find them, you know, Etsy is a good place to start. So that's cool. I'm glad that you like those. Yeah, exactly. I did get them on Etsy, and I was going to paste the link, but I wasn't sure which one, because one of them, one store had buy two, get one free, and one had buy three, get one free, So and that was a better deal. Um, but yeah, I've seen the wood ones, too. They're a little pricier and, and bulkier, mm -hmm. but of course they would look more authentic, so it's mm -hmm. that's your trade-off there. Yep. Um, Lindsay, one more question for you. You have two really great posts that I'm going to put in the event page right now that are like... 10 household items that can improve your food photography and they're these like great little cheats. Do you mind sharing a couple of your fun recommendations from those posts? Yeah, um, okay I'm just trying to think so let's see. Um, I know off the top of my head like tin foil is one of them or also a mirror that those can kind of or even just white paper mm -hmm. those are great you know stand-ins for um, for reflectors. You could just even sometimes I'll just grab a piece of printer paper and fold it in half and just kind of hold it up in a certain spot while I'm shooting and it'll reflect some of the light. Um, another thing I've done that's kind of fun is I'll, I've taken a shoe box and then just laid printer paper flat on the table and another piece I'll fold it halfway over the top of the shoe box so that it creates like a, like a continuous background of white mm -hmm. and then I'll just set my food on there and then it, you know, you can shoot at like from the straight on angle with the full white on the table and the full white background and all it is is printer paper. It's like <laughs> printer paper mm -hmm. and a shoe box. Um, I'm trying to think what are some other ones that I've... Um, like a tweezers is kind of a weird one. A tweezers can help you like move stuff you know when you're styling. Honestly I don't use... I'm I, like I'm too lazy. I'm like oh, I'll just use my fingers. But if I really need... if I was styling for a client I would use it. Um, and you know, Q-tips. You can. I just used Q-tip today to wipe the side of a a bowl. If you don't want to like dab your, I don't know what, your finger or like a paper towel in there, you could just use a Q-tip to kind of clean up the side of a bowl. Um, so yeah, those are some. I really, I'm a huge like, I'm, I'm a huge believer in just use whatever you have. You know, make it work. And um, yeah, those are some of my some of my little hacks for food photography. <laughs> Exactly. They are hacks and they're super cool tips. Like I read those posts and I like, made this little list like put Q-tips by your food stuff and yeah. tinfoil and I've used those exact ones and it really does, it's amazing a piece of tinfoil yeah. like, or paper, the difference it can make and it's yep. cheap. Yep. No commitment, you know, that's awesome. Um, I'd love to hear a quick story from both of you like the funniest cheat you've ever pulled off to make a photo look good that people wouldn't guess because of the angle that you were able to choose or whatever. Do you have any of those stories, Suzanne? Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, doing that sort of thing all the time, I guess. But a lot of it happens in editing, like editing out the burnt bits or oh. the, you know, the, the spills that you didn't know were there and that sort of thing. I mean, I've even made one food look like another food through editing. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can do all sorts of things with, with editing. If you've got a few skills there, you can, you know, using your clone tool and different tools, you can... Um, move things around. You've only got two raspberries or three raspberries, but you can throw a few more raspberries in there once you're in the mm -hmm. editing field and make it look a, a bit better. I mean, as for right at the moment, it's things like um, Lindsay said, but also maybe just spraying a little bit of oil on things sometimes can lift them if they're not looking quite so good after you've taken a while to take your shots. Just uh, spray them a little bit, move things around. Certainly you stuff the bottom of plates so that it looks like you've got more food. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can prop things up to make it look prettier. And then in editing, if some of that prop shows, I just edit out the prop and it, it leaves the food looking sort of more upright. Just things like that really, fudging I it. That's funny. I love the editing. <laughs> I had someone doing a cover for one of my ebooks once and erased like pepper. I had too much pepper on a hard boiled egg and little uh -huh. stems of grapes Look at that all. have grapes on them and just erased them all out. I'm like, ooh, that is cool magic. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, how about you? Do you have any fun stories of cheating out? Um, this is probably this is kind of embarrassing. It's my most embarrassing one. It's kind of gross. 
But I had made this recipe. Um, it was like an eggplant parmesan, and I had made it like I had already made it. And um, I, I'm trying to remember now if I had already taken the photos, or I think maybe I had taken some photos, but I wanted to take another round of photos. And so I went to go make it again, like the next day. And I had everything that I needed except I didn't have um, the right kind of pasta that I that I was going to use. It was like using penne pasta in like a baked dish. So then basically what I did was I took the eggplant parmesan and just laid it over the penne pasta. That was the that was the what the recipe was supposed to be. Um, but I didn't have any more penne pasta. I had used it all for a different recipe. And so. I, for the photo, I took the penne pasta that I had already used for a different recipe, which I still had in my refrigerator, and I rinsed the sauce off of it, <laughs> and, like, rinsed it all out, and, like, took out the pieces of whatever it was, like, tomato, and, like, just cleaned it up, and then used it in my other dish to photograph, because I was so annoyed. I didn't want to go to the store. I was like, I have this leftover stuff. I could just, so I literally just put it in a strainer rinsed off all the sauce and then covered it up and repurposed it for my other one. So that's kind of a gross one, but that's probably my most funny or embarrassing <laughs> cheat that I've ever done. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so how long, like shooting a, a recipe like a dessert or a main dish, how long do you usually take, do you think, to do a single photo shoot for one item and about how many photos do you take before you feel satisfied? We'll start with Lindsay this time. Okay, well, um, <laughs> I take a lot and I'm kind of slow, I think. So um, I would say from start to fi like I could do it in, let's say, I could. I feel like I could get one or two good photos in 15 to 20 minutes, but usually I spend like an hour um, with a dish and so I'll be cooking it and like a lot of times I'll be taking photos while I'm cooking it or trying to at least um, in the kitchen and then by the time you know an hour means like I move the table over to the window I get my props out you know I put it on and then by the time I get everything the shots I want and I get it all cleaned up um, it could be anywhere from like maybe 45 minutes um, to an hour that I spend so I'm kind of I'm kind of slow but I'm kind of particular and I also am going for like eight to ten photos that I could use on my blog. It's not just like a one-shot kind of a deal um, for me. So um, I, I end up, I probably end up taking anywhere from 100 to 200 photos and then I just grab like ten of the best and I'll try to, okay, so when I shoot like I kind of have a, a, a like in my mind I'll do three in the kitchen, like three of prepping and then once I bring everything out to the table where I'm actually doing like the formal, you know, shoot, I'll try to do maybe um, two of the dish like in the in its entirety and then maybe two of the dish on a single serving plate and I try to mix it up between like front angles and you know top down angles and I try to keep all the lighting the same usually once I decide on what kind of lighting I'm, I'm getting um, or I want to get but yeah I, I take a lot and I'm kind of slow and it always takes me longer than I think and so I don't know that's just me. Uh, do you ever do like a bunch of dishes in a row or try to do some stock photographs so that once you've gotten all your stuff out you can save time or are you generally shooting as you're cooking or like you know within immediate as you're cooking? Yeah um, when I was like teaching and my schedule was a little tighter I would try to do more um, you know kind of all at once but it's really hard because if you're cooking if you're also cooking the recipe you know, it's not like, it's like bam, 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 like you got to cook, photo, cook, photo. So um, I'll do, like I've done as many as, I did 10 recipes um, and photos for them in a weekend for a project I was doing for Bon Appetit. That was a lot to me. That was really a lot. Like I did five on Saturday and five on Sunday. Make the full recipe. And they were all casseroles. Like they took forever. All of them took mm -hmm. like at least an hour to make. And Ugh. Anyways, that was kind of not the best experience, but um, but in general, now that my schedule's freed up a little bit, I really I try to time when I'm making it over a meal time. I know that's not realistic for everybody, but it's just because it's my job. I feel like I want to enjoy it, and I enjoy it most when it's at a meal time, and I'm going to be able to either eat it for that meal or for my next meal um, instead of like cooking at 9:30, you know, cooking a hot dish at 9:30 in the morning or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's. I, I don't know. I guess I, I try to space it out. I, it's tiring. It's really tiring 
like when you're on your feet and you're cooking and you're photographing, so I try to yeah. take little breaks in between. Makes sense. Suzanne, what's your normal photo shoot, like length and number of photos? I'm at the opposite end. I do it all very <laughs> fast. <laughs> I sometimes, I take two photos and I'm there, done. I, um, I, no, I, wait a minute, let's, let's distinguish here. Lindsay is putting a lot of photographs on her blog per recipe, whereas I put one and uh, also when I'm shooting for my clients, they're wanting one shot. So okay. I only have to focus on that. I used to on my blog do some of those preparation ones and in-between ones, but it just drove me crazy having to interrupt the process of cooking. And a lot of it is cooking for the family anyway, and they're waiting to eat. Yeah. So I, um, I'm, I've learned to be real fast. I've dragged my equipment out before I start cooking. And a couple of shots, looks like I've got it right. I run into my study, which is right next door, and I've got light room up throw them in there, just see. yes, I can do something with that. But then there are other times when I just can't get it. You know you, you know that your composition's not right, your angle's not right, so you're, you're changing, chopping and changing, you're adding things, taking things away and, until you get it right. So but I would still say nothing more than 20 to 30. That would be a max that I would take at the moment, mainly because I've got a family waiting to eat mm -hmm. and it's like, got, got to get out of there. And I know I can do stuff in Lightroom anyway to make it look a bit better and clean up the dish or, or whatever needs to be done. So I'm fast, very fast at it. I would love to have more time to play around with it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not a reality, unfortunately. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. You guys are finally on opposite sides of the line on an issue here. That's good to hear. Um, and, and it may be that the, the children at the table banging their forks, too, because <laughs> you just got Bjork banging his fork, saying, right, cold food, right. cold food. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I've gotten to where I do them the next day because I can tell if I try to grab one between cooking and serving, oh, my goodness, not only am I in Michigan with, you know, 6 o'clock p.m. is not the greatest time for natural light at any time of year, but I just, you can tell in my shoots that they're just rushed. I'm like, this is not what I was going for, so I need to, I'm, I'm probably right in the middle of you guys I'm, as far as number of shoots and number of minutes, but. I think that's um, really smart, Katie, because like I, um, you know, I think, I just think it's really smart to not always do it right when you cook it. If you have a food that can withstand, you know, however many hours in the fridge mm -hmm. and just reheat it, re, you know, re-liven it with a little water or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that's really smart. Like, even even though it's only Bjork that's waiting, you know, for our food, <laughs> um, or and me too, um, a lot of times I'll, I'll even just not, like, even if I'm cooking around lunchtime, I'll just make something for us to eat first and then, <laughs> you know, make it. And because a lot of times, um, you know, nobody, it just, it's not fun. It's not fun to be photographed. And, like, you rush yourself, like you said, and yeah. the quality suffers. And I think it's smart to, to do it the next day. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to hear more about editing for you gals because, Suzanne, you've definitely hinted a couple times at the magic of editing. And I've already confessed that I just refuse to learn that skill. <laughs> so <laughs> what, I mean, how important... Is editing, can you do, can you use your, you know, your three techniques that you've already talked about as far as manual settings, lighting, and good composition, can you make an excellent photo without editing it at all? Or do we need to learn fancy programs? Can we just use, like, whatever came with our computer? What are we, what, Suzanne, what, what's your opinion on that one, Miss I erase things and add raspberries? <laughs> <laughs> I, um... Definitely you can take photos by using the right techniques and the right composition and not have to play with them in uh, Photoshop or Lightroom at all. If you, you, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, <laughs> if you take your time and you do it right, right. you don't have to. It's mainly because I'm a bit rushed that I've had to learn how to use the Lightroom so, so well, I guess. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I, I throw photos in there. I'm really happy with them. I might just lighten them a little bit or throw in a bit of wash light on them and and I'm done in you know a minute two minutes so with all my talk about editing and raspberries and things that those are unusual circumstances normally the shot that you have taken with your camera is a decent shot and so I mean I play with it because I can but I don't think uh -huh. you necessarily have to know good to know finally a shortcut Lindsay what do you think can you do can you do it without much editing or with just like low low caliber editing? 
Yeah, when I started, I um, did all my editing in iPhoto because that was all I had on my computer. So I would just import my photos. They would go right into iPhoto, and then I would just use the controls in there, which are really basic. There's just like an exposure bar, a contrast, a saturation, stuff like that. Um, and that's all I would use. And actually, in Tasty Food Photography, um, that's included in the editing that I talk about. So I'll talk about in Tasty Food Photography. I talk about Lightroom and Photoshop, but also I talk about iPhoto because you know, obviously, not everybody has a Mac. But for people that do have a Mac and they're not ready um, for the bigger editing um, softwares, it's it's a great alternative. And I don't think I don't think it's needed. I think if you know your manual settings and you know how to make it you know, make the photo look the way you want it to. Um, it's not like you it's not like you need to edit it. That being said, you can do some really amazing things with editing. And even when I take a picture and I'm like, oh I love this. I love this photo. Then I edit it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I loved the other version of it. You know, <laughs> this one is so much better. And um, the the number one thing that I would say about editing, or at least that I personally have used for editing and that's made the biggest difference for me is white balance. And I use um, Photoshop to do all my editing, so that's where I learned how to use. I think just I, I, f I found the white balance to be a little easier to use just for me in Photoshop. Um, for the other controls, Lightroom and Photoshop seem about the same. But yeah, um, white balance, edit, you know, editing that, making your colors look look clean and the whites look actually white. I mean, those kinds of things. Even when you think you have a good photo, it can take the photo from really good to like really wow, pop off the page, amazing. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's important, but I also think if you're taking great photos, it's not like something that you need to have. So. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. I've sent batches of photos that were taken maybe around the 4, 4.30 p.m. mark, and I'm like, wow, they're all blue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just all the whites are blue. I'm like, that was well composed, but it's so blue. And mm -hmm. thankfully, the gal I paid to edit my photos won't do her magic, and they come back with whites being white. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, we got to squeeze in a couple last tips here. Is there a secret to getting on big sites like Taste Spotting and Food Gawker in like one or two tips? And, and does it really, has it brought traffic? to your blog at all, Lindsay? Food Gawker uh, and Taste Spotting, I would attribute them to like like half of the growth, not really, but like a lot of the growth of my blog, um, especially when I was first starting out. Pinterest was less of a big deal. So, um, you know, the, the, that was where almost all my traffic came from. And even to this day, Food Gawker is still within the top 10 traffic sources, even after being featured on big sites like, you know, BuzzFeed or Huffington Post or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, um, food Gawker still shows up, so yes, it's worth it. And as far as tips, sometimes it's just really unpredictable. And I think you know, just the more you can, I don't think there's any magic trick. I think the more you can just improve your photography, um, you know, make it look natural, make it look vibrant. Um, I don't know. Again. <laughs> right. I mean, it's frustrating, man. I would get so mad at the. I'd be like, "Food Gawker hates me because they're not accepting <laughs> any of my photos." But you know, as your photography improves, you're so personally invested in it, emotionally invested mm -hmm. in it. Just like mm -hmm. take a step back, continue to learn, continue to improve, and you know, you'll see them getting accepted more. So, great. How about you, Suzanne? Any experience with the sites? Yeah, um, like with Lindsay in the beginning, it brought heaps of traffic and that's how I also built a lot of my blog was uh, through that and through getting people through Food Gawker and Taste Spotting. They bring less traffic now. They are still up in the top 10 but they bring less traffic than they used to. They used to bring you know hundreds and hundreds of people in but now it's not nearly as much as that. And as, as for tips, I mean there are a few because you, you know, you, you get your rejections and they give their reason, which is normally, a, for me, a ridiculous reason, but hey, that's us being a bit precious about our own photos. <laughs> um, but, for example, they don't like you too close on the food. They definitely don't like that. They don't like unusual angles. They like most of the, the main basic angles. Nothing too arty. Mm. And as I was saying before, they, they go on and on about light and they don't like it when you blow out the light from the the back which I love and they, they call that bad lighting so and also composition they go on about composition sure. so even those who take good photos can still get them rejected and you I mean now if they reject one of mine it doesn't even flutter my heart anymore but it used <laughs> to <laughs> 
That is great, girls. Um, I want a couple random tips from you. And Lindsay, if you have some more stuff in Lightbox that you want to share with us, we'd love to see it. You talked a little bit about your blob of stew, Suzanne. Um, and Lindsay, I noticed in your light box, or that one picture you showed us had like pouring dressing. Are there any are there any little tips about things like that? Taking pictures of ugly food, doing like motion shots, like running water, um, you know, just kind of little little random tips that people can take and be really practical. Do you have anything more for us, Lindsay? Um, yeah, let me just switch back over to that mm -hmm. if I can figure this out again. Lightroom. Okay. Um so can you see it? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so like this one with the pouring dressing, um, I'm actually working on a post right now that will probably go on my blog sometime this week that's all about pour shots, like P-O-U-R, like pouring, you know, right. pouring your food. Um, <laughs> not to the other way, yeah. Um, but, but my biggest tip, I guess, would be, um, well, okay, I said before I never use a tripod. This is a really good time to use a tripod because it's, like, really difficult to do this on your own. That being said, again, I hardly ever use a tripod. It's a lot easier to do it. And I just, like this one, I just poured myself. I'm just holding it and pouring it. Um, but I would say... Um, um, your shutter speed needs to be, you need to pay attention to your shutter speed for photos like this. Um, and the other thing is having good contrast. So like right in here, you can see all the different colors and textures. That makes it easier for the camera to focus um, because there are so many different things um, to pick out. I, I find that when everything's all the same in the bowl, it's hard, like my camera, um, you know, comes back in and out trying to find a spot to focus on. So mm -hmm. having a lot of different colors there can help. And then um, let me see if there's anything else in here. Oh, I would say um, just as a, a final takeaway, um, like if you're not sure with lighting, start with side lighting and just like that's my number one tip overall to anybody anywhere. Start with side lighting and like here's an example. You can see this side is brighter and like here you can see the shadow. This is a little darker. The light would, this would be where the window is. So I'm mm -hmm. standing like next to the window and then the light kind of washes over the food and it creates those dark and light spots. So like it lights up the tofu there and gives it some highlights. Um, that's just really, that's just a really easy way to, um, you know, make a difference in your food photos right away. And then, um, where did I go with that? This is the another green example. herbs. I got to point out the green herbs yeah, yeah. in there for rookies. Like, seriously, throw some fresh green herbs or even all, like, in the winter, if I don't have herbs, I'll slice green onion. Even yep. if it doesn't necessarily yep. fit the dish perfectly. For sure. If you, go through, if you go through my blog, it's like literally every every photo has something on top of it just because yep. it helps it, you know, look a little more vibrant. This is another example photo just of that side lighting where the window is over here and you can see, like, this side is brighter and this side is a little bit darker. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid of shadows. Um, and, and start by putting the window at the side. Um, you know, both Suzanne and I, um, whoops, we're talking about, I'm just going to try to switch back here. Switch and talk, I'm not good at that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Wait, am I on? Am I on again? You're, you're okay, I'm on. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, but just she was saying about the backlighting that she likes that, which I also do, but I feel like that's a little bit more tricky. Um, so I would say start with the window at the side. Um, and, you know, I think you'll be amazed. If you've never intentionally paid, paid attention to light like that before, it's like, pop, all of a sudden, you know, the highlights and the shadows looks really awesome, so. Very cool. Was that last picture, were those your favorite boards underneath? Yeah, those boards were the ones um, mm -hmm. that I, the, from that table from in the Philippines. So, yeah, those are my, that's kind of my go-to. It's really warm and, like, yeah. really textured and just unique. I really like those. Yep, and I noticed you had like the rustic loaf of bread kind of in the background blurred out. Like just all those things. You can start to look at pictures and you see like this is what makes it look finished and complete. And the herbs, you know, huge difference. Yep. All that sort of stuff. Suzanne, what do you have for us on not making our food look like a blob? <laughs> um, mostly what Lindsay said. It's all about different colors and contrasts and textures in the photographs. I mean, a plate of stew is all one texture, and so that's what you're fighting against, and one so color, of course. Do? What would you do with a blob of stew, like, specifically? All right, I'd be taking some of the ingredients out and actually washing them off, mm -hmm. and then placing them on top of the... <laughs> okay, so the, carrot the, here. The brown mess. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I've definitely done that. You know, a piece of carrot, wash it off, and stick it halfway back into the stew. 
and a piece of meat, just sort of dry it off a bit and place it so that you, it's because mostly stews are sauce, aren't they, with yeah. bits of brown mush in them. <laughs> so you're just seeing the actual ingredients and then it is just sprinkling a few herbs or a few coloured spices or something like that on top. Or even with stews, you can still do that thing of a little swirl of cream or of sour cream. Mm. Just get your contrasts of some colours and some textures to, to make a nice shot. Yeah. Yeah, I had um, I had an ugly, ugly casserole coming out of a slow cooker that I needed to take a picture of. And Suzanne and another gal um, in a Facebook group I'm in had all these ideas. You know, you need some green on top. To, you know, have some. It had rice in it. And Suzanne said, put some rice around it without any sauce. And somebody said, put it. It was a cabbage casserole. Put it in a raw cabbage leaf as like a holder. And the pictures turned out so cool. Luckily, I had some uh, cherry tomatoes on hand, so I just set them kind of around to add some red to the picture and it was great but I was really concerned when I first embarked on the project thinking this is going to be, this is going to look like mush, this is going to look so gross and like slow cooker stuff especially is all um, so just these little practical tips and like if you can chat with other food bloggers too just great. Ladies I've learned a ton tonight and I my to-do list is ever growing and has again as far as what I need to learn um, very very happy to have you both on Remember that you can find Suzanne at strandsofmylife.com and if you're a food blogger, she might take pictures for you and even <laughs> does blog reviews, but even more importantly, she does the low FODMAP coaching, which is incredibly important for um, IBS sufferers, of which there are more and more all the time. So definitely look that up and then check out Lindsay at pinchofyum.com or foodbloggerpro.com, is that right? Yep. Yep. That's for the, yeah, so both of those, great. She does have a lot of food photography stuff on Pinch of Yum, as well as the ebook Tasty Food Photography, which is going to be open on my computer pretty soon <laughs> when I get yeah, to that point in my to-do list. Katie, we actually, um, I don't know if you can put this in the show notes or whatever, yes. too, but we created a discount code. So if anybody's watching and they want to check out the book, um, if you use the code JULY30, Mm -hmm. um, just like J-U-L-Y 30, that'll give you 30% um, off of the book. And you can wow. just buy it right on Pinch of Yum. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's Perfect. a helpful Perfect. tool for somebody. Yes, thank you. I will put that in the event page and the show notes. July 30, we got it. Um, any last words, ladies? Did I skip anything important? I know we're over time here. Um, nothing, just, just the technical side of it. Don't get too caught up in that camera manual. It really is the f-stop and the shutter speed. Learn those and you'll take good photos. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would second that completely. And it's totally worth the time and the headache it, it takes to learn it. It's, it's going to help you control the photos and, you know, get good photos that look the way you want them to look. So, mm -hmm. All right, all right. Twist my arm. i got to take another <laughs> step here now that I've learned. <laughs> That's all right. It's okay. I need to keep improving. And we always do as bloggers. It's a huge learning curve and we know it. Thank you ladies. I know we ran over but the Im information you shared was so very, very valuable. Um, again, the Chaos Connect Plus Google Hangouts are taking a break for the summer. This was a special pop-in because I couldn't resist sharing and learning this information. Um, so again, Suzanne from strandsofmylife.com, Lindsay from pinchofyum.com and foodbloggerpro.com. Gracious me. Thank you so much for coming. Have a lovely evening or day, whatever it is where you are. And yeah. thank you again. Uh, show notes and YouTube video will be up on Kitchen Stewardship within days. Thanks, Katie.